and we'll go. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to the Athletes Wisdom Podcast. I'm your host and creator, Alexander Turner, and today we have an amazing, amazing podcast going on. I actually have a special guest. His name is Mark Burrick, and today we'll be going over how to turn your passion into profits as a college athlete, all right? Hey, Mark, how you doing today? What's going on, Alex? Thanks for having me, man. Hey, thanks for hopping on. Um, for one, I just want to say you are my first official uh, uh, video guest, so this is pretty exciting for me as well. So I'm glad that you're able to, uh, you know, just help me out throughout this process, and that you're patient through all the behind the scenes uh, technical difficulties. So I appreciate that. <laughs> A little experience, but everything breaks, man. Everything always breaks. Exactly, exactly. So I know that uh, when we did initially speak uh, yesterday, uh, you know, I went over a few details, went over a few things, but I just kind of want to, you know, share that wisdom and that knowledge that you shared with me to, of course, the public. Um, so I do want to start off with, like I said, this, this podcast is how to turn your passion into profits, right? But in order to understand how to turn a passion into profit, I feel like I need to define what a passion is. So according to Webster, right? Passion essentially is an intense desire or enthusiasm for something or strong or barely uncontrollable emotion. So essentially, for those who are watching right now, right, it's that thing that you have so much feeling for that you can hardly control yourself. You can hardly sit still. That thing that gets you going up like that, that brings you energy in the morning, that gets you going throughout the day. So in my, ver in my mind, that's my version of what a passion is. So uh, I want to start off, Mark. What is your passion, right? What is your passion and how did you find out what your passion was? You know, now, yeah, now it, I could have argued that it would have been at some point, but I think early on I just figured out it was teaching. Uh, mm. The ability to, to share new knowledge, even when I was playing uh, in college and pro and high school, like I, was, I was always also coaching and I was trying mm -hmm. to lead way so to me the the passion is definitely teaching like it's, and i say this at some of our camps but it's really cool when i get to work with you and today you can do something that you couldn't do yesterday that's like mm -hmm. i'm so fired up for any exactly. other moment so that's uh that's a big thing for me is teaching how were you able to discover this passion because like you said you originally thought it was sports or you thought it would have been in an athletic but you realize it's not that so how did you discover that it was actually teaching instead of actually sports shoot um you know i played sports i guess coming out of the womb probably <laughs> um, <laughs> but i started uh i started coaching which is crazy when i was 13 uh, my first job was like i was taking this uh, tennis classes during the summer and mm -hmm. then he the leader he asked me hey do you want to coach the really young groups and mm -hmm. i enjoyed it i loved it and then people you know when you start you're, you're good at something and then people support you they start telling you wow you're mm -hmm. awesome wow you've got this great energy and you're like ah oh, i guess i do you just start believing them and so you start mm -hmm. pursuing that more because you want some more of those compliments and i think a few of those older people and you know my first boss who's he was like no you've got such great energy for this you're so good at it and whether he just wanted to keep me around as an employee or <laughs> he actually <laughs> thought I was good, you know, it worked. Um, so I just kept going in that. And then when I, when I started playing pro was when I actually realized it. Cause mm -hmm. I said, you could be the best athlete in the world. Right. And you could have like millions of people watching you, but then what value do you give to the world at that point? And if you're not, if you're very effective at bouncing a ball or bouncing a ball off your body, what does that mean if you're not making the world a better place? Um, mm -hmm. so I never felt completely fulfilled by just having people watch me play sports. It was, all right, what can I do for them once you have that platform? And so when I was playing pro, I started right. asking the clubs that I was playing for. I was like, hey, can I coach some juniors? Hey, can I work with some adults um, on the mm -hmm. side? Because we had a few extra hours. So I think – I think it was when I went overseas to play ball that it was really turned on for me that I didn't just want to play. That's dope. That's dope. And I'm glad that you mentioned the overseas aspect, right? Because I did forget that you mentioned that. And I want to ask you uh, when we originally spoke, how was that process to going overseas, right? Because I understand that uh, there are only so many spots in any professional sport, right, for the professionals. 
But there are a lot of people, probably a 10 to 1 or 100 to 1 ratio of people who are trying to get into those one spots. So how was that transition going into overseas? Because that is a lot more popular uh, now and a lot more people are doing that. So kind of explain that a bit for me. Yeah. Uh, for volleyball, for men's volleyball, there's a few ways you can do it. You can be an absolute rock star and then some club somewhere, like either a Russian club, a Polish club, um, Korean club, Chinese club, whatever, they can – they can contact you and, and offer you a contract. But for most people, you end up going overseas on some sort of tryout. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have to do that only because a guy who graduated two years before me, he was already on a pro team. They knew that they needed an outside hitter. So they knew that they needed somebody mm -hmm. to need that, um, the position that I played. And he gave me a call. He's like, hey, you're graduating. I know the I know the system that you were trained in. Um, mm -hmm. I I know that that our shared college coach is like an excellent passing coach. And he goes, honestly, we've got a young collection of passers and I want somebody who can be a leader who can share those same things. And he goes, mm -hmm. also, I suck at strength and conditioning and I suck at passing. <laughs> so he goes, like, I kind of want you to come and be a leader, even though you're going to be a rookie first year. So um, that was how it went. And then talked to the club manager and he's like, all right, be here October 16th and got a flight to Sweden. Oh, wow. Uh, so throughout that process, right, um, like you said, a lot of people tend to go on tryouts. They end up, you know, not being able to get a call the way you were able to get a call. How does someone go about getting a tryout, right? How does someone go about getting that exposure to where they're able to not only get a tryout, but have a solid chance at showcasing their efforts and getting a spot on, well, that's an international team. And I'm sure it's probably some minor league teams as well, because I'm sure it's probably a similar process here. Uh, in the States for professional leagues. Yeah. You know, I would say like now it's different because I'm what, 37. Okay, so can you hear me? I can hear you now. All right. Now it's a little bit different because when I went over, I mean, Facebook had been around for three years. There wasn't any live streaming. No one was like posting highlights on Instagram. Like now kids, juniors, you can make your entire highlight tape without having to send that DVD or a cassette <laughs> or something. <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> I'm so sure they have AIs for that now. Oh, man. Yeah, but I mean, now it's easier for coaches. They're just, they can swipe through as well. Mm -hmm. I think if you were doing it now, you would sure just get video, right? Just get a bunch mm -hmm. of video and make sure that you post your, your best highlights. Um, for us, the coaches also want to see you play in person. That's a big deal. And you have to make the commitment to actually saying, yeah, I'm going to go overseas. So mm -hmm. a lot of players, and I don't know if they're still running this, but I know at least as of six years ago they were, uh, they run these big tryouts. So there's one company of agents, and they bring anybody who is interested in playing that year mm -hmm. that want to get recruited. They'll bring them to a gym somewhere in Europe, and then you might travel to a few other gyms. You scrimmage gotcha. against each other. You scrimmage against some like local maybe junior pro teams or practice squads of pro teams. And then they mm -hmm. also call all the coaches that need players. And they're like, hey, we got a 100-person tryout here. Do you want to come and pick us up? So it's kind of like the version That's of dope. the combine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That, all right. That, that makes a lot of sense. But it's – all right. I like that. I like that. So – and I, I'm glad that you kind of tweaked that. It's like a version of the combine because a lot of people are always focused on, like you said, the combine this, combine that. And they don't – often hear about opportunities like this so basically just that's kind of like a nice tip because it's essentially the same platform just in a different country or in a different you know uh time zone or whatever the case is yeah and it's a little so, different in volleyball because like they don't take all these physical metrics they just watch mm -hmm. the ball and they're like gotcha it's one arm we should so do it for a few weeks yeah <laughs> so so your play speaks for itself yeah okay so how were you able to shift um, playing overseas into starting the company and the business that you have now? Because I know that you said that played a part in like the transition to it. So kind of explain how that came into fruition. Like how did the overseas play? Because we spoke yesterday, so I know it's a, it's a lot more in between, but I don't want to, you know, speak on anything. I want you to explain to yourself. The, uh, all right. So in the off season, like the, the in season for indoor beach volleyball is usually mm -hmm. September or October to like April, May, maybe a little bit longer. And, mm -hmm. uh, when you come home, you can lift, you can hang out, you know, like I played a lot of beach volleyball and mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a 
different sport because it's two on two versus six on six. Uh, and obviously sand versus indoor. But mm-hmm. then there were some coaching opportunities. So I would go around the world, uh, around the country coaching for a company called Gold Medal Squared. So I'd like stay with um, a host team for four days. And so I started coaching mm-hmm. like that and kind of cut my teeth coaching volleyball a lot like that. Then when I went back overseas, there were people who knew that I was coaching, knew that I was a pretty good player. And mm-hmm. so I started working a few volleyball vacation camps, basically like um, a company from Sweden and Germany. They bring everybody to Spain and to Tunisia and to Turkey. That's and cool. it's just sick vacation, seven days, parties, playing all day, partying all night. Um, and <laughs> all players, so it's sweet. That sounds like fun. I need to play yeah. volleyball. <laughs> yeah. You should. <laughs> it's a good time. Um, and so like doing that form of coaching where, where you had people sleeping away, like I saw a lot of the advantages, mistakes in the way it was run. So piece mm-hmm. by piece, I started putting that together for myself. And when I decided to stop playing indoor professionally and take a beach professionally full time, I said, you know what? People need to be exposed to California and this lifestyle out here. And so I would invite them to basically my apartment and then a few more apartments. And I would like Airbnb arbitrage and Mm -hmm. they would stay with me for a week. They would hang out with all my buddies. All my buddies were pro players. So it's like they Mm -hmm. were in this inner circle and they were getting trained in volleyball five days or five hours a day. So that's kind of the majority of it. When they would come over, uh, when you would, like you said, do the Airbnb arbitrage of sorts, but for the camps in California, how long were they with you, right? Like, how long was that time period in which they're staying with you, which they're training, which they're playing? Like, how long was that? Uh, so one of the models that we still have now, it's it's seven days. So you mm-hmm. come on like a Sunday afternoon and we do dinner and some play that night. And then for the next five days, Monday through Friday, we are going at least five hours a day. Of training mm. and if you were to come to the camp then like once i'm done coaching you or once our team is done coaching you you also sit courtside watching pro practices mm-hmm. so you get coached and then you get to watch it and then saturday we throw a little bit of a tournament or if there's a local tournament we encourage you to go there and then on sunday that's when uh we say goodbye and hopefully see you at the next camp gotcha gotcha so it's a full i wouldn't call it hell week it's like for a lot of people, it's seven <laughs> weeks, you know, but it's, it's five to seven hours of volleyball a day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is a lot of rigorous training, no matter what the sport is. So when it comes down to, like you said, it's a week time frame, right? And of course you want players to come back. Of course you want them to be able to ascend. Are there any like opportunities for them to say, get into a pro league or, or maybe anything like that by coming to your camp? Our training would allow that. You know, gotcha. Any, if you're going to the next level, no matter what, what sport, what endeavor, it's about how many hours are you able, how many reps are you able to put in outside of any practice? Like mm-hmm. we tell our people, if you come for a week with me, look, you got five to seven hours a day, um, five days in a row. So that's at least 25 hours. Most people mm-hmm. only practice or train like four to eight hours a week. And that's usually play. It's not training. So mm-hmm. we're getting at least five times the reps in our practice sessions than you would in your play nice. session. So if we like, you know, if you do the math, like eight versus 25, all right, we're getting three times as many reps as you can. So now that's three weeks in one week and then five times. So that's like 15, basically in one week with me, that's 15 weeks of your own training. Dang. All right. Whew, that's you got to look at reps, and that's what all <laughs> athletes have to look at. Like, I, I came to volleyball pretty late, so everybody had played club and all of that stuff ahead of me, and I was like, hey, mm-hmm. they had two practices a week, two hours. All right, so if I do four practices a week, if I do six practices a week, then I'll catch up to them in half the time. You know, so I for me, it was always like, all right, how, where can I find reps mm-hmm. that these other people aren't? When they go get water, can I, like, chug water and then go get five jump serve reps now i'm ahead mm-hmm. of them one step now i'm ahead of them one step so any time i was looking to progress in a sport or anything else it was how can i double or triple my reps compared to anyone else around me and that's how i would get ahead so how does that mentality transition over into the business aspect as well right 
And because you never stop, <laughs> <laughs> never stop. You know, if you don't stop, you can't fail. The, the thing in, in most businesses is no one's there actively trying to stop you. Mm -hmm. like when you have competitors in sports, people are trying to stop you. They're trying to beat you. That does happen in business sometimes, mm -hmm. but for the most part, you're just being ignored and it's just, it's your own failure. No one's like messing you up. So it's all about how many reps can you put? How much education can you get? How many great coaches can you have that are watching you and, and helping you progress? So it's way easier theoretically mm -hmm. in business. You just have to bring that same mentality that you had as a championship athlete. I don't want to say as an athlete because a lot of athletes suck, right? They, like, <laughs> they show up, they do the bare minimum. Like you showing up to your practice with your coach that's the bare minimum. That's the bare minimum. That's what, the, that's what they expect you to do. <laughs> yeah. So if you're not doing anything else after that, like if you're like, oh, I'm a business owner, I'm an entrepreneur, and I put in eight hours today, you're doing mm -hmm. the bare minimum that an, an employee, an average employee would do. Exactly. Right? So if you're going to start your own thing, your own entrepreneurial spirit company, whatever, you got to attack it the same way that you thought about if you were a championship athlete. And it's how can I get more reps? How can I get smarter coaches, better training and put myself mm -hmm. in places that, that have better athletes. So that's, that's the mentality that I think you have to have if you're, if you want to be successful in anything. Very much so. Very much so. And I'm glad you said that because oftentimes, right, when people come into a new space and I, and, and I hope that the people who are listening that are listening to this really took heed to the way he just said, because I feel like that's probably the biggest piece of advice he's said thus far. Um, you have to continuously put in the work, right? You can't expect to get to great levels without putting in great amount of work. It doesn't matter if you're new to it. It doesn't matter if you're old to it, right? Going in and just giving the bare minimum will not get you the extreme and high level results that often most people are wanting or looking for. So you have to be able to do the things you don't want to do, put in the extra hours of work. Like I said, if you're transitioning right whether whether you're transitioning from an athlete into a business owner whether you're not an athlete at all and you're trying to become a business owner only putting in the bare minimum the eight hours of work is going to get you 100 hours of work worth of success right like how kobe said right he got up at 4 30 actually i'll tell the story that i heard right and i'll tell it pretty quickly basically it was um i want to say it was when they were the dream team or the redeem team whichever one i think it was a redeem team and they were basically, you know, training to kind of like win the gold. And I think it was Chris Bosch said, he said, yeah, I'm going to get down there. I'm going to be at practice and I'm going to practice before anybody wakes up and yada, yada. He said right when he's going down to get breakfast, right, he sees Kobe drenched in sweat coming from a 4.30 a.m. workout, right? And that's kind of like the same mentality that you have to have, right? Even if you're thinking, I'm going to get up early and work before anybody else, there's probably somebody else that's getting up earlier than you. So you still got to put in that extra work. You still got to put in that extra leg of effort in order to get to that extra level that you're really looking for. So in doing that, right, how has that extra effort, that extra work ethic, how is that transition and how, how has it grown your business to the levels and heights that it's at now? A lot of... So now that I've said, like, put in that death work, right? Put in the work mm -hmm. until you die. Uh, mm -hmm. you, that's something that that is the requirement. You won't succeed without having that. And then hopefully you get efficient, smart enough, just like a good athlete would or a good coach would and say, like, hey, sit down. You got to recover because mm -hmm. if you don't if you don't chop this up the right way, if you're doing strength or explosive training every single day, at some point, like an injury is going to happen. Something's going to break or you get stuck in your progression. So. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes, all right, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Now, how can I be as efficient as possible by hiring the right people, um, by, gotcha. by hiring the right coaches? And so for me now, it's been about building my team. And in the beginning, building a team was weird because I didn't translate sports into being an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. right? I didn't say like, man, I'm the coach. I'm the athletic director part of my job is recruiting a bunch. Of <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like I got a one man team here and that's, that's not going to work. So in the last, I guess, three years, because I, I brought my best friend on who went to college with me and uh, mm -hmm. we run it together. 
we started making all these translations back to our college team. Like what would we allow and not allow on our college team? Like what kind of behavior would we have? Because if somebody showed up late to our college practice, like you had to run, uh, you had to carry these like 75 pound dumbbells around a, a quarter, quarter mile track. And we had these expectations of behavior. And there were things that like our coach was doing behind the scenes that we didn't see, but we knew were happening and things that we were disappointed. Mm -hmm. Like, dude, why didn't you get that guy? Who cares if we had to give him a half scholarship instead of a quarter scholarship, like get him mm -hmm. and give us the wins. Um, so now we're making like every translation back to what would we really allow on our college team? What would we want there? And if our college team was absolute top of the world, what would we mm -hmm. do then? It's tough for me to go directly into business without using that translation. Mm -hmm. you know, so I think now that we're doing that, we're, we're recruiting a lot better people, um, being a little bit more efficient. We're trying not to get, trying not to everybody have everybody micromanage each other. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, yeah, you get one coach on athlete meeting per week, right? But he's not in your face every single hour of every single day, like sitting on top mm -hmm. of you. His coach is exactly. exhausted and you wouldn't have a team. And I'm glad you said that, right? Because I feel like any athlete who has played a team sport truly has that advantage when it comes to business. Because you've already been in a setting where you, like you said, you don't want to micromanage people, like, but you also need A players, right? So it's trusting the people to do their, basically their job, their role, their position, right? And then letting them and allowing them to come into it, right? Because not, we're not all going to just be a, not everyone's going to be an A player right out the gate. Sometimes it takes a little bit of work. It takes a little bit of trust and faith to get to that point. So that's why I just think athletes, you already have that advantage when it comes to building a business, right? Because like you said, in order to build a business, what you said earlier was you're a little bit nervous when it came to finding people and hiring people, right? It's being a bit nervous on being that coach, being that recruiter, while also being the player. But it's just a slight mindset shift. You're already in the right zone. It's just, okay, how do I find somebody while also trusting someone? So yeah. I feel like that's a, that's a, <clears throat> excuse me. I feel like that's a good pivot as far as what would be two actionable steps that you could give an athlete, right? Uh, when it comes to, let's just say there's an athlete, whether they're still currently playing or whether they're done playing, right? What would be a way that they could do actionable steps right now to not only start a successful business, but grow a successful business? I mean, let's let, we'll say that you got to move beyond, you know what you want to do, right? Um, that's got to be the first. You can't just say, ah, I want to start a business. Well, let's figure out what, what you actually want to do, what you're going to be passionate about, what you enjoy, and what you know. That's the fastest route is going mm -hmm. to something that you know. Uh, you just got to convert it into business. The next thing that I'll tell everybody, and it's what I tell athletes too, find a coach, find a mentor. Yes. Right? There are – and I'll, I'll give you guys some steps – after this to actually do it because everybody says find one find one it's like where, where am I? Where am I? <laughs> it's like how do i find one <laughs> <laughs> uh, somebody like i was watching this comedian last night and he goes he's like if i got transplanted like we developed time travel and i alone went to the past like i ended up in like 1820 mm -hmm. he goes i don't think i would have a difference in history because i have no idea like Hey, you know that phone that you're on? Like, you don't need wires for it. You can call somebody <laughs> and they're like, oh, how does it work? He goes, I get, well, we got to put like some metal things in the ear. <laughs> and he's like, I wouldn't be useless. Like, I wouldn't tell, I wouldn't know how to do it. Exactly. Um, so all of, all of our progression is built on the knowledge that people have before us. And they can help you skip years and years of pain yes. and mistakes and errors it will like with one talk, you know, I had a coach that, um, he went to the Olympics and everything. And he told me to take this one swing in one situation. And I was like, where the hell were you 10 years ago? You know, <laughs> that, that play cost me. <laughs> you know? and I'm studying film, I'm working with coaches, but you know, he just taught me one way to get out of it. And I was just like, damn it. That, that was thousands of points mm -hmm. in one, in one comment, not even a conversation, one comment. And so if you take that, you take that mind-blowing coach that says one comment that just, you know, opens your game, you can do that in business too. 
and you can do it quick where they're going to get you out of that error stage, the exploration stage and go, no, no, no. A hundred people already tried that. It doesn't mm -hmm. work. Here's what the top 10 are trying. Let's exactly. focus on this. So finding that coach, finding that mentor is going to help you skip all of that. And then you just got to figure out like, am I going to grind and Google and try to figure it out on my own for 10 hours, which I mean, probably we're on restream right now, right? Yeah. Like, just figuring out restream. Somebody had to dedicate on your team 10 hours to figuring out if it's a good fit or not. Exactly. Like, instead of just going to somebody and saying, what podcast platform should I be on? Mm -hmm. I use restream. It works. Go. You're done in 30 seconds exactly. with that's the decision making process. Yeah, somebody told me about this, and that's that's why, because I was trying to find, like, your biggest disadvantage is what you don't know, right? And it's, it, people always try to figure out the, how can I do this? How how can I learn all this information in a short time frame? How can I, and it's who, not how, right? Because that who is going to give you the information that you don't know, so you're able to have those advantages. Like you said, what, not even a whole conversation, one comment. It was, you found the who. And then he gave you the information that you didn't know in that one comment. Now, like you said, if you found him 10 years ago, you would have saved an immense amount of points. But those two things, that mentor is going to give you that who, not how, and give you all the information that sometimes you don't even know that you're looking for, but you end up needing anyway. Right? Look at it like this. If, if, somebody, if somebody has the answers for you, mm -hmm. and it would take you, and most people don't know that it's going to take them 10 hours just to find out what software, you know, that's a minimum like figuring out what software by Googling and going into every link and every review and all that nonsense. Um, so let's say that that would cost you 10 hours anytime you need to make a decision for what platform to use. What if you just took somebody who did it or is doing it at a high level already and you said, hey man, I'll work for you for five hours if you just give me a half hour of coaching. Like now you just saved four and a half hours, you know, and you got to work under the wing. You've given this mentor something where he's actually going to support you now instead of just mm -hmm. saying, hey can i get more free advice hey can i steal your time more hey can i steal your time more it's like for your half hour of time i'm gonna give you five of mine and it's going to net me you know th th i've saved four and a half hours exactly exactly so, there's there's a lot to be said for that and if you're if you're just going into it like wild wild west <clears throat> find somebody, ask somebody, post on your Instagram, say, does anybody know anybody who does this or has done something like this? Get that list, write all those names down and tell them what you're doing. People are afraid of like competition. Oh, but they'll steal my idea. It, those are the people that have never started a business because just mm -hmm. starting a business takes years of your life and dedication. So it's not like people are just going to be like, oh, what a great idea. I'm going to beat them in one day. <laughs> <laughs> and i'm glad you said that because i will say that honestly when i before i originally started my business right they always tell you if you if you have something good don't share it with other people they'll they'll steal it or you know their energy will bring you down and maybe yeah in very rare cases that does happen right but in most cases one thing i've learned when i started my business and started reaching out and started networking People love, other business owners love to help you along your journey, right? Even if it's, even if you're talking to a business owner that technically is not in your niche and technically doesn't do the same thing that you're doing, you can still learn something from them, right? You can learn something from everyone. So it's like starting and then just asking, being open and honest enough to say, hey, I don't know this, but I need help. Are you able to help me? These are my ideas, right? And then they can help you analyze, break down the ideas, help build upon those ideas. And who knows, maybe... Like you said, not only just asking them for advice, but giving some of your time to add, you know, in, in exchange, that's building a relationship. And that might be somebody who you end up partnering down the line with or, you know, maybe can recommend you to, you know, something else, so on and so forth. So it's just taking that extra time to put yourself out there. Right. Like, don't be afraid because, like I said, it's possible that somebody might steal your idea, but the, the chances of that is very slim to none. And all those like those like ideal stealers, most of us don't have the billion dollar ideas, you know, where it's like this crazy <laughs> patent or some yes. new invention. Like for us, we're trying to run volleyball classes and training. We're just trying to do it in a different way with like a little bit of higher energy um, mm -hmm. going into it and create a couple opportunities that aren't there. If somebody else wants to start it. All right, fine. That's almost like rising tides, you know, lift all boats.
So mm-hmm. if two people are doing it, then people are like, oh, they might hear more. He might be doing more marketing for you than mm-hmm. they somehow find you just because they like your your voice better. You know. So Exactly. I wouldn't I wouldn't stress on not letting your secrets out. You know, I'm not saying give every single weapon you have, you know, in a PDF to the person who's trying to come up and do exactly what you're trying to do, but mm-hmm. don't be bothered by it and don't be bothered by sharing that information unless it's, like I said, some patent that you know is going to change the world and be yeah. billions. Then, yeah, you got to figure out how to <laughs> gotta move around a little bit. Yes, so I, I definitely, I definitely Besides understand. NDAs, that. Yeah. <laughs> Actually. I need to get more into the NDA, like make sure NDAs are incorporated in my business. I didn't, because that, that, although that's something I had no intention of talking on, NDAs is, like you said, most people will not have that billion dollar idea. It might make you a few millions, right? But most people won't have that billion dollar idea. So, but for the people that do, NDAs are extremely important, right? Like, Does everybody this, know what an NDA is? <laughs> I know what NDA is, but yeah. explain it. Explain it for the people who are, who aren't familiar. Uh, I think uh, the words are non-disclosure agreement, which basically yes. means that whatever you do in this company, you're not allowed to talk about it on the outside. Some people also throw in a non-compete clause, which means like if somebody wants to coach for me, all right, mm-hmm. you can coach in within 30 minutes travel of the area that we're coaching for the next mm-hmm. year after after whatever or any amount of time anything exactly like and non-disclosure agreement says that like legally you cannot talk about this and if it is proven that you did or you use some of the resources that you acquired while working with that company they could come after you legally the, the, exactly the, the worst part about that is everybody's going to lose in that situation because you're going to pay legal fees you know it, well, they're, they're going to put you the back. lawyers are winning but as far as the businesses yeah everybody else it's 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 not beneficial for the most part. No. But if you do it right, and if somebody really did break it, and your business is worth millions, then then it becomes worth it. But if you you know if you're only netting like you're living the life that you want, but you're only netting like five thousand a month, that's gonna hurt. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna hurt to get that lawyer to go. To <laughs> exactly. You have a threat and hold over their head, you know. So I do wanna. Because I don't want to take too much of your time, so I do just want to kind of ask one last question um, uh, to to tie it a little bit back into the passions and the profits, right? How were you able to help? Um, like, give me one instance in which you were able to help someone discover their own passion and how that person was able to turn it into profits. Like, pr- particularly an athlete, if possible, but even if it comes down to business, if they were able to turn into profits. Hmm. I mean, they're able to turn into profits in terms of points. <laughs> well, I mean, you get enough points on the board, I mean, I guess you can get a deal and get a contract. That's true. Uh, for So here's what we started doing, and I'll, I'll answer by not really answering. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we started doing at our camps, we started doing like the development groups. So mm-hmm. when you come to our camp, something that I added this year, just because it's a conversation that I want to have more, is we break up um, in between practices and at lunch into groups where I'll lead a talk and then I say, Hey, let's go over what we went over in practice. But then we say Mm -hmm. everything that we learned here, like beach volleyball, two, one, two, you have to learn how to be a great teammate. You have to understand your partner, what makes them tick, what pisses them off. You have to know these things. And then you have to actively figure out how to be the best version of those things. Mm -hmm. So we take moments like that and we say, if you need this for volleyball, you need this in your life. Like if you can't be a good leader on the court, then it's going to, you're going to struggle to be a good leader in your business. So you have to figure out how to translate anything that you have on the court Mm -hmm. into whatever it is that you want in your future, in your business. And most people, we hear that all the time. Like at Mm -hmm. at the beginning of the episode, um, you're like, well, great athletes can make great uh, employees and great employers. The thing about that is somebody's got to draw the the lines that make it make sense. Mm -hmm. Because not everybody says, remember what you did here on the court? Like Mm -hmm. when you patted your buddy on the ass because he was down and you got him back into the game or you told him a joke when he was 
out of the game and he like kind of laughed and then he got back going. He got his swagger back. Mm -hmm. How do you bring that to your family? How do you bring that to your best friends? How do you bring that to your work? And exactly. if, you, if there's nobody there, that's what the great coaches do. It's not just on court, but they're making you a better man or a better woman, right? Mm -hmm. Through those lessons. Because if you look at those and you just experience it on the court and nobody says, how are you going to bring that to your life? Mm -hmm. You won't bring that to your life right away. It might gotcha. take some, some exploration. So for us, it's more those lessons of how our coaches treat people. How we're always open. We, we never treat any question like it's stupid. Um, mm -hmm. and we always check in with our people. So one of the rules that we have for our coaches is as soon as somebody walks up to the court, you say, Hey, you greet them. Because for me in my family, when I walk in the front door and my wife's like, Hey Mark, Hey sweetie, she comes up, gives me a hug. That's so much better than her just sitting there like watching TV and <laughs> continuing to click through like that. Would mm -hmm. suck. And I want my daughter to be the same way. Like I want to run and be daddy. And that makes you feel good. <laughs> exactly. Um, and that same thing should happen when you walk up to a court, when one of your teammates goes up to a court, um, it, if you're a coach or if you're a player, get them up, pound them, say what's up, what's going on, and then make sure that you know what's going on in their life. That's mm -hmm. a big thing for our coaches is you have to ask them something about their life. And one of the things that I'll, I give away and your audience might like it, it's called Ford. Um, and it's a way to figure out what questions to ask other than how you doing because mm -hmm. every place is good and you don't get any information. So Ford, I learned is you ask about one of these things, family, occupation, um, relationships, and dreams. And so if you just need to open up a conversation and start talking to somebody, you say, hey, how's that thing that I knew that your family was going through? Like, I heard, you know, your brother got a promotion last month. How's he mm -hmm. going? Is he treating that well? They're like, oh man, this guy's listens to me. He understands me. They'll open up more to you. Occupation. That's like, good. How's that job going? Um, I heard it, you know, cause we were talking last, last week, you said something was tough at work. Next mm -hmm. week's relationships. Um, and it could be like if in, you're in high school or college, like with your best buddy and you guys got into a fight or it could be boyfriend, girlfriend. And mm -hmm. the last one is dreams. Like, do you know any of their goals that they've been going through, um, or that they wanted to achieve? Like, Hey, I know you really want to get that new car. How's that going? You get yes. involved in their life, you That's know, dope. and it's, and it's a cheat code for maybe it's for guys, just low EQ people who don't like know how to open up a talk, talk. Mm -hmm. And that plays a huge difference in our athletes, in our business, the way that people I like care, that one. because now you're connected to people. So, that was good. I, I don't know if the audience took heed to that advice. I hope they did because I definitely I, – I was writing it down when you said it. That's actually – I'm good at conversational skills and, you know, talking to people, but that one's a good one right there. So I definitely, I definitely appreciate that. And like you said, that can translate family, business, sports, whatever the case may be. So, Mark, I appreciate you so much for coming on. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Can you go ahead and let the audience know where to find you at, uh, all the amazing value and things uh, that you provided? I definitely want to make sure that they are able to continuously receive that from you. Yeah, definitely. Um, we got a couple projects that are going on right now. First of all, if you just want to check my stuff out, it's at Mark Burrick on Instagram, M-A-R-K-B-U-R-I-K. And my, my volleyball company is called Better at Beach Volleyball. Mm -hmm. If you look better at Beach Volleyball on Instagram, uh, you'll see highlights and coaching nonstop. And then a project that I have, which I'm probably following um, a few months or weeks behind in your footsteps is I want to talk to uh, entrepreneurs as well mm -hmm. who are turning their athletic or their fitness passion into a business. So people who are like just it. getting started or have been in it for a couple of years and are mm -hmm. to hit that next level, um, you know, because I want to get you on my podcast. Most and definitely. <laughs> I want to talk about the business side of what you're doing so that we mm -hmm. can help anybody down the road who's coming up and like this is struggling, turning their, their sport enjoyment into something that, that could be their job. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's a, uh, that's entrepreneur athlete. And that'll be a podcast. It's tough to say we might use athletic startup. I, I don't know. <laughs> for now we're just talking to people so if you guys want to hear good conversations and you're in a podcast platform make sure you run down all of alex's and athletes wisdom and then once you're cleared his cue then come on over to mine hey i definitely appreciate it and i'll make sure that i include all the necessary links below so they can uh make sure they tap in with you and follow you as well cool cool appreciate all it. right 
Hey, thank you so much, Mark. And thank you listeners for tuning in. Uh, if you haven't already, make sure you go ahead, subscribe, and make sure you hit those post notifications as well. And we will see you on the next episode. Let's go.